Good morning, church, and I hope you are doing well this morning. I just want to take the opportunity to say Happy Father's Day to all the dads who are out there. It is a wonderful thing that once a year we take the opportunity to say thank you to our dads for all that they've done for us. Being a dad is not an easy thing, and being a good dad is really not an easy thing. So we just want to say thank you. Uh, we love you, and I uh, hope that you feel appreciated today uh, for all that you do. We're going to continue in our series on the churches in Revelation, but before we do that, let's just bow and unite our hearts together in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you now, and we give you thanks for your goodness. We give you thanks for your blessings. Uh, thank you for the dads out there, and we pray that today they would feel blessed and appreciated. We thank you for the blessing of your word, Lord, and when we think of all the blessings that you have bestowed on us, uh, Lord, what a wonderful blessing your word is to us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds now as we look into it, Lord, give us understanding, show us what it is that you would have us learn from this text. Teach us, Lord, may your Holy Spirit teach us, guide and direct us in this time, we pray, amen. Well, we are almost through our series on the seven letters to the seven churches, as I mentioned. And this morning, we are going to look at the second last church in the list. And that would be the Church of Philadelphia, the letter to the Church of Philadelphia. The Lord is pleased with this church. He wasn't pleased with all of the churches that we've looked at thus far, but he was pleased with with this church, the Church of Philadelphia. And what a wonderful thing it is when the Lord is pleased with you. I think of the parable of the talents that Jesus told, where a master, he gave one servant five talents, he gave another servant two talents, and he gave another servant one talent, and then he went away. And when he came back, he discovered that the first two, the one he had given five talents to, and the one he had given two talents to, they had used that wisely. And to them he said, well done, good and faithful servant. He was pleased with them. Very often, we like it when people are pleased with us. We seek human approval. We like that. But God's approval is so much more important. In fact, the day is going to come when all that will matter is, does the Lord approve of us? That is what we should be seeking, His approval. It's what we should be longing for. That should be the driving force behind the decisions that we make, is what I do pleasing to the Lord. The approval of God, that was what the Church of Philadelphia received. This is not to say that they were a perfect church. They were not a perfect church. Uh, there is no perfect church on the planet. There would have been problems with the church in Philadelphia, of course. But overall, this was a church without any significant flaws, and it is a church that the Lord says nothing but good things about. So let's read the text together. This is Revelation chapter 3 and verses 7 to 13. Uh, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In verse 8, we find the familiar phrase, I know your deeds. We have seen that phrase before. We saw it last week when we looked at the letter to the church of Sardis. 
The phrase actually, the phrase I know, those two words, they show up in each and every one of the seven letters. Uh, the letter to the church of Smyrna, Jesus said, I know your afflictions and your poverty. The letter to the church in Pergamum, he says, I know where you live. In the other five letters, though, we see the phrase, I know your deeds. And this phrase, I know, it serves as a reminder that God knows the true spiritual condition of each and every one of these churches. Their spiritual state, their spiritual condition is not hidden from Him. He knows what's going on. He knows what each church is like. And in the case of the church of Philadelphia, uh, they possess two qualities that the Lord commended them for. There is no criticism or condemnation in this letter. It is just commendation. Two qualities, and those are, those are going to be our two points for this morning, the two things we're going to look at. Point number one is loyalty. Loyalty. This was a church that was loyal to Christ. Now, by loyalty, we are talking about an unwavering sense of commitment and dedication. And we see this in verse 8 here. This is where we get this from. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, when we think of loyalty to God, the loyalty of this kind here, we think of men like the prophet Daniel, who refused to pray to anyone other than the one true God. He was told to pray to the king, King Darius. He refused to. He was going to pray to the one true God, even under penalty of death. We think of men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were commanded to bow down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. And they refused. The reason they refused was because they were fiercely loyal to the one true God. They were not going to worship any other gods, the one true God. They were loyal to Him and to Him alone. Years prior to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is God speaking the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. These are the first two of the ten. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. In other words, the Lord is saying here, you are to be loyal to me and to me alone. There is no room for divided loyalty in Christianity. And the reason for that is because, as the text says, God, he is a jealous God. He loves his people and he expects his people to love him, to love only him. Not to love him and other gods, not to serve him and serve other gods, not to worship him and worship other gods. God and God alone. Completely loyal to just him. I was thinking of a passage from Luke. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone come to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, we should not conclude from a superficial reading of this verse that we are to hate our family members or anything like that. Not, even not to hate our own lives, we're not to do that. That would violate the commands of Scripture. We are, as Christians, we're not supposed to be a people who hate, we're supposed to be a people who love. That's what we're marked by. That's how we know, in fact, that we are, in fact, Christians, is if we have love. Jesus here, he is focusing on priorities. Very often, we are loyal to family members over and above other people. We are loyal, first and foremost, to family members. 
Uh, if our family member is in need, we help them. A lot of times we help our family before we help others. If someone hurts one of our family members, uh, we often get upset. We're very loyal uh, to our family members. But as loyal as we can often be toward our family members, we are supposed to be more loyal to God still, more loyal to Christ. There is absolutely nothing, there is no one in our lives that should hold a higher place in our hearts than God Himself. You are probably familiar with the old and very popular hymn, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. It's in probably most every hymn book out there. You may, however, not be so familiar with the story behind that hymn. A lot of our hymns, they were written from very incredible circumstances. And this one is no exception. Uh, there was a man and his family living in a village in India, and they were converted to the Christian faith. And the people of the village were not overly happy about that. And they dragged the man and his family before the chief. And the chief told the man that you need to, you need to reject your faith. You need to recant your faith in Christ. And he wouldn't do that. He actually, when the chief told him to do that, he sang a line to a song that he had written himself. And he sang, I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back. And when that happened, that man's children were killed. Uh, he was given another chance. And he said, if you don't recant your faith, your wife is going to be killed. Uh, to which he sang the words that he had written, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. His wife was killed and he was told that if he didn't recant, that he himself was going to die. To which he responded, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. And he died. That is loyalty. That was the loyalty of the prophet Daniel. That was the kind of loyalty that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. That was the kind of loyalty that the church in Philadelphia had. And I hope that is the kind of loyalty that you possess as well. Nothing, no one greater than Christ. Loyal to others, yes, but more so to Christ. More loyal to Him than to anyone or to anything else. So that is point number one. That is the first quality that we see in the text of this church of Philadelphia, this church that the Lord was very much pleased with. The second quality that we see in this church is the quality of endurance. Quality of endurance. Uh, loyalty precedes endurance. It comes first. It is, the it is the necessary prerequisite, if you will. If you're not loyal to a cause, you won't endure at it. Uh, if you are not, for example, if you are not loyal to your spouse, uh, you won't endure hard times with your spouse. The chance is slim anyways of that happen. It is the same with Christ. If you are not loyal to Christ, uh, you will not endure when times get tough. It, and often it is only when times, get, uh, when times do get tough that we find out the level of our endurance and therefore our loyalty as well. In verse 10, this is where we see that the church of Philadelphia, they are a church that has endured. Verse, uh, verse 10, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come in the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I think of the Apostle Paul. He was a man who, these two words in here, endure patiently, those two words, they accurately describe the Church of Philadelphia, but they accurately describe the life of the Apostle Paul, and we know more about the Apostle Paul, obviously, than we do about the Church of Philadelphia. The Apostle Paul, he was no stranger to hardship. 
The road that he walked as an ambassador of Christ, it was not an easy one. There was pain, there was suffering, there was turmoil, there was persecution. It was a very, very difficult road for him to walk. And he actually, in the book of 2 Corinthians, he talks a little bit about some of the things that he has endured. He says this, this is verse, uh, this is chapter, uh, the 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Pressure, persecution, pain, suffering. The Apostle Paul, uh, he was not unfamiliar with any of it. He knew it all. Uh, but what was his attitude? His attitude he never said, this is too much, I can't take it anymore, I'm done, I'm going to go and throw my feet up somewhere where it's safe and live out the rest of my days. That wasn't what the Apostle Paul did. He was characterized by patience. He was characterized by endurance. And, in, and endurance and patience, they go hand in hand. He patiently endured, you might say. He put one foot in front of the other... And he kept going, and he kept going, and he kept going until the Lord called him home. It was actually the Apostle Paul, he compared the Christian life to being very much like a race. And a race, there are many different lengths of races. You can have a 100 meter race, you can have a 400 meter, 800 meter, you can have a 5 kilometer, a 10 kilometer. You can have a half marathon or even a full marathon. There are races of all different distances. I remember a couple years ago, I was training to run a five-kilometer race. Um, I was training with a friend, and, him, and he and I, we would go out, and we would run for miles and so on. And when it came to the five-kilometer race, speed was important. Speed was important. You wanted to cross the finish line. You wanted to be able to look at your watch and say, well, I did that in good time. I made good time. And so you would push yourself. But more so probably than worrying about speed, sometimes you weren't, think you weren't thinking about speed. You were just thinking about endurance. There were times where you were out there and maybe you hadn't had much sleep the night before, you hadn't eaten properly that day, or you hadn't drank enough water, but you came to a point where you're going, I'm exhausted. I am done. I don't feel like I can keep going. And at that point in time, you're not thinking so much about your speed and, you know, am I going to cross the finish line in good time? You're just sitting there thinking, I want to keep going. I don't want to stop. I want to endure. Endure until I make it across the finish line. And that is what each of us are called to do in regards to the Christian faith. Yes, there'll be obstacles, yes, there'll be trials, yes, there'll be suffering, but we patiently endure all of that as the church in Philadelphia patiently endured all that they were going through. We have to keep in mind these people were living in a time and in an era when it was very difficult to be a Christian. There was persecution, and to be a Christian could very well have been a death sentence for a lot of them. Many of them died because they were Christians. We don't really understand too much about any of that in North America. We live very comfortable lives in North America, and we don't know very much about the concept of patiently enduring hardship. Some of us are, of course, more familiar with it than others, but for the most part, many of us, we live very comfortable, very easy lives. Uh, we get upset when our air conditioner breaks down because now we have to sleep in 25 degree weather instead of at a perfect room temperature. Uh, 
that bothers us. Our lives are filled with appliances and technological gadgets that are designed to make our lives easy and more comfortable. That's the world that we live in. Not necessarily a good thing. Not necessarily a good thing because we run the risk of becoming so soft and so loyal to ourselves that when the time comes for us to endure for the cause of Christ, we may not be properly prepared uh, to patiently endure as we will be expected to. But to those who do patiently endure all the obstacles that come our way in the Christian life, the, the rewards will be well worth the pain and the suffering. In this letter to the Church of Philadelphia here, Jesus talks about the rewards. The rewards for this church and the rewards for the whole church of Jesus Christ across the globe as well. Verse 10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, which we have looked at, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. There are different views about what exactly Jesus is referring to when he speaks of the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole earth. Some believe he is referring to the great tribulation that the Apostle John goes to speak of throughout the book of Revelation. Seven years of trial, of persecution, of God's wrath being poured out on the human race. We're not too sure what exactly he is referring to here. I don't so much buy the opinion, um, but I don't so much buy into the viewpoint that he is referring to the tribulation. I could go into the reasoning for that, but I won't. Uh, basically, just what he is referring to here, whatever is meant by this, uh, the Lord is promising protection to his people, uh, those who are loyal, and faithful. Whether he's talking about the Great Tribulation or talking about a certain era of persecution that was going to come upon the known world at that time, whatever it was going to be, the bottom line here is God is going to protect His people from the hardship, from the suffering that was to come. And this is, of course, what will ultimately be experienced by all who are loyal and faithful to Jesus Christ. This is what we have to look forward to. We will be protected. We will receive divine protection from eternal judgment, from eternal wrath that is to come for all of those in hell. I was thinking the other day, and I was thinking even this morning actually, of John 14. A wonderful passage and a very comforting one. John 14, 1 to 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. I will come back and take you to be with me. That is the reward for all of those who are loyal to Christ, all of those who have patiently endured the trials that have come upon us in this life, who haven't denied the name of Christ, but they have endured all the trials, all the tribulations. Heaven will be the reward. Eternal protection, eternal security, eternal rest. There will be nothing anymore. There will no longer be anything to, en to endure but everything to enjoy. Verse 12, Jesus goes on about the rewards of those who are loyal, of those who patiently endure, those who are faithful. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven, from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Two things from this verse. There are two rewards that we read about in here. First of all, the victorious, they will be made into a pillar. 
Now, obviously, the Lord is using metaphorical language here, metaphorical language that is so typical of the book of Revelation. A true believers are not going to be made into literal pillars in heaven. However, uh, they will be the recipients of all that pillars often represented in the ancient world. John MacArthur, he writes, A pillar represents stability, permanence, and immovability. Pillar, pillars can also represent honor. In pagan temples, they were often carved in such a way as to honor a particular deity. The marvelous promise Christ makes to believers is that they will have an eternal place of honor in the temple of God, which is, of course, heaven. So that is the first reward. The victorious, they will be made into a pillar. Secondly, the victorious will receive his name. God is going to write his name on us. And some will argue, of course, is this literal, is this metaphorical, what exactly does this look like? All of that discussion aside, the point here is that having a name on you represents ownership. We see this elsewhere in the book of Revelation as well. We see it in regards to the mark of the beast. In Revelation 13, 16 to 17, this is what the text says, I also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. There are some who will be stamped with the mark of the beast, which is the name of the beast. Uh, but for us, though, for believers in Jesus Christ, those who are loyal to Christ, when they are in heaven, they will be stamped with the name of Christ, signifying the fact that He owns us. He owns us. We are His. And indeed, for all of eternity, he will be ours to enjoy as well. That is the reward for the believer. Those who have patiently endured, those who are loyal to Christ, like the church in Philadelphia was loyal to Christ, like they patiently endured all the trials and tribulations, all the persecution that came their way. They will be made into a pillar. They will receive Stability, permanence, this is what heaven is, it's for all eternity. The joys of heaven for all eternity. Nothing left to endure, everything to enjoy. And we will have his name marked on us for all eternity. He owns us permanently throughout all eternity. So that is the letter to the church of Philadelphia. And what a wonderful letter it is, a church that the Lord found favorable. And we pray that that is, would be the same for us, that he too would find us favorable. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. Lord, we thank you for this church 2,000 years ago, who they were loyal and they patiently endured the circumstances that they were in. Father, I pray that we would be loyal as well, that we would be found favorable in your sight. That we would impatiently endure everything that the future holds, Lord. We don't know what it holds. We don't know all the circumstances that we're going to face, Lord. All the bumps in the road as we run this race. But give us the grace to patiently endure to the end. And we look forward to that day when we do cross the finish line when we will be in heaven with you for all of eternity. We will be yours, and you will be ours as we enjoy you, as we enjoy your presence forever and ever. We thank you for that day. Help us, prepare us to be ready for that day. We want to be found pleasing, to be, we want to be found favorable in your eyes, Lord. And I pray that we would be that. We pray this in your name. Amen.